Welcome to the Trust Us, We're Professionals podcast with your friends from SSC, CPAs, and advisors. This is the podcast where we break down financial matters found in pop culture and, you know, kind of the national conversation. This podcast covers mainly financial matters, so we probably won't chime in on the chicken wars. Actually, we might. The correct answer, of course, is Wendy's. All kidding aside, what we try to do is make complex financial matters easier for our listeners to understand. We're able to do that because we are all licensed financial professionals. And if you have a license, clearly that makes you a genius. I'm your host, Chris Underwood, a financial advisor with SSC Wealth. And once again, I am joined by Michelle Hammond and Tim Metz. We wanted to have a lawyer on today, but unfortunately, Kim Kardashian felled her baby bar so we had to settle on Mets. Well, someone had to bail you out. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to break down in your openings, Underwood. Like, first off, Wendy's is not the correct answer on the chicken wars. Of course it is. A spicy chicken sandwich is, of course, the correct answer. It, it's never the correct answer. Never. Oh, Tim, then what is the correct answer? Not Wendy's. In today's episode, we are going to talk about Bernie Madoff and Ponzi schemes. Madoff recently passed away, which thrust him back into the national conversation. But frankly, he never left. He's been a big part of pop culture for years now. So we'll discuss Madoff, warning signs for any investment and or the person selling it, and some ways to protect yourself and your money from these predatory, uh, what's the word, douchebags. If your financial advisor works out of a van and only accepts cash, that's a huge red flag. We'll start there. All right, Tim, Michelle, all kidding aside, in simple terms, what is a Ponzi scheme? A Ponzi scheme starts in the fact that if somebody is telling you about a great investment that you're going to get rich on quick, if it's probably too good to be true, it absolutely is. So um, a Ponzi scheme um, at its base is usually tied to somebody promising you high return on your investments, right, Tim? Absolutely. They usually start with something like that. Yep, that's exactly right. Trust me, I got a hot stock tip. If one of the 20 great takeaways you have from this, um, from this podcast is that by the time you're hearing about a hot stock tip, it is no longer a hot stock tip. <laughs> It's dead cold. <laughs> it's dead cold. <laughs> and uh, the odds are that person wouldn't be telling you about it. They would just already be in Tahiti, right? That's right. And yep. or driving their new Porsche. Yep. Wait, I got a Porsche. Oh, right. I still don't have any hot stock tips, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we broke down the mechanics of a Ponzi scheme, what is the simplest way to explain it to our audience? For those that don't know. Well, I would start off by saying it is the ultimate house of cards. I mean, there's no better way to describe it. So, you know, a Ponzi scheme is you, you have some person, they're they're the the kind of the central operator, they're the focus of the investment, and they're out and they're selling things uh, to people. And 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 I mean, this is just a real simple explanation, but but essentially what they're doing is going out and they're stacking layer upon layer of investor behind the next investor and they're building this nice hoard of cash and sometimes the initial investors in this enterprise will get paid back and they might even hold that person up as an example of their success but you know i'm, I'm a recovering banker and it's a lot like check kiting you know check kiting is where you write progressive checks on different checking accounts and you don't have any money in any of those checking accounts but each bank is cashing the check thinking you do and the bank that loses is the bank that figures it out last. Ponzi schemes are the same way. The people who figure out they're in the Ponzi scheme and lose the most are the ones who figure it out last. So they're using the new money to pay some of the initial investors to make it seem legitimate. Exactly. And then they might be using the rest of it to put in their own pocket. You know, buy yachts, buy fancy cars. You never Porsche. know. <clears throat> Porsche. Porsche. <clears throat> Not true. <laughs> All right. Well, a little history lesson. The name comes from Charles Ponzi, who was an Italian swindler. That is literally the language used in Wikipedia and con artist in the United States and Canada. He promised clients a 
to your point, a 50% profit within 45 days or 100% profit within 90 days. What was actually happening, though, like we alluded to, Ponzi was paying earlier investors using the investments of later investors. His scheme ran for over a year before it collapsed, a la a house of cards, like Tim mentioned, costing his investors, in quotations, $20 million. And if you adjust that to today's dollars, that is $250 million. Did you ever see that guy's mugshot? I mean, I've seen lots of mugshots and, and not my own, mind you, <laughs> but I have seen lots of mugshots and that guy has the most impressive smile because he knew he got away with it temporarily. But if you look at his mugshot, he is just smiling from ear to ear. Charles Ponzi yeah. or Madoff? Charles Ponzi. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to Google that. Yeah. You should look at his Creepy. picture. Handsome man. Big smile. You seem to have a deep admiration for Mr. Ponzi. Bigger criminal. <laughs> Okay, so there's some history on the Ponzi scheme, but let's talk about the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, Bernie Madoff. Again, he recently passed away. Tim, Michelle, why is he such a big deal beyond just running the biggest one in history? Well, big always equals a big deal. Um, I would say that the amount that he was able to swindle for as long as he was able to swindle and at the level that he was able to do is just, it's unheard of. Yeah, it was amazing. Long time. And he, and he swindled extremely sophisticated investors. Absolutely. And doing so in a way that his family didn't even know, supposedly, what it was that he was doing. So I think um, he was, it, Ponzi had a great smile. I would say Bernie Madoff had a great smile and an unassuming way about him. And he was just somebody that you wanted to believe and that was, had made returns supposedly for other people. And so uh, people kept believing him. So what he would do is he also had people who gathered the investments for him, but he would go and tell people he has um, if they'd like to invest in his fund, they'd like to put some money in Madoff Investments. He would take those checks directly, put them in his bank account, and then he would produce fraudulent statements that showed all these trades, all this activity, and these really great returns. To the tune of $65 billion, again, the biggest in history. And he was so trustworthy that he attracted all sorts of celebrities from Kevin Bacon, <laughs> To Steven Spielberg. I'm not laughing. Kevin Bacon is a big celebrity. It's just, you know, I always think of six degrees of Kevin Bacon. But Steven Spielberg, I believe the Mets owners were in there or the old Mets owners. So, I mean, people believed him. Yeah. Well, he, he represented the appearance of old money. And, you know, with that comes kind of a, an inherent trustworthiness that's just imputed to you. And, and I think he sold that up really well. He was, he was extremely effective. And if you looked at him, he kind of looked like your, your grandfather, like somebody you would want to do business with. But Lo and behold, he wasn't. And I think it shows the power of a referral and people wanting to do business with other people who are doing business with famous people and getting great returns and hearing great things. I mean, if I probably if Kevin Bacon told me he's got a great investment guy, he's probably not going to um, sway me into moving my investments. But these are also were large um, pension funds. Yeah, these were sophisticated investors who were investing with Madoff, um, not just people looking for a get what get rich quick scheme, um, because it, uh, it was too good to be true. He had just given high results over and over and over again um, to buy people's trust. You know, he talks about, or they talk about in one of the books that I had read about how he leveraged um, his church and his religious affiliations to say, well, of course you do business with me. We're, we, we go to the same church. We both have the same religious background. He leveraged relationships to take advantage of people, which is probably, you know, that's really, really the, the saddest part of this is the leverage of relationships in that way. Absolutely. And we'll dive more into this later, but referrals are generally speaking a good thing, but they can be problematic. And we'll touch on that more later on. Well, let's talk about how, you know, people were writing checks to, I forget the name of the company, but it was Bernie Madoff's company. And let's talk about how people can protect themselves and a potential warning sign in the sense of what a custodian is as far as your money and your wealth management goes and how important of a role that plays. I think it plays the most important role. You know, they're a independent third party. Uh, in most cases, they're they're regulatorily um, uh, compliant. They get um, examined by 
FINRA and by other organizations like that. But at the end of the day, you know, they're essentially a non-bank bank for your funds. And so, you know, they're required to uphold a, a very high standard of quality, of security. And, um, you, you know, that's that's why we do business with them. They, they take the Bernie Madoffs out of the equation. Absolutely. So at SSC Wealth, for example, um, you write your check to NFS, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Fidelity. That's the custodian. Not You never write a check to Chris Underwood. Speci- <laughs> in, in if Underwood tells you to write a check to him, give me a hauler. That, that, would, that would be the problem. But you're writing a check to a custodian, not to a person. And in this situation, people were firing off checks to made off investments or whatever the, the name was, which is a bank account, which is wholly go- governed by himself. Yep. So that's a warning sign for you to look out for. Since we're talking about Madoff, and this is a sort of pop culture-esque show, let's talk about The Wizard of Lies. It was on HBO. It starred Robert De Niro as Bernie Madoff and Michelle Pfeiffer, the wonderful Michelle Pfeiffer as Ruth Madoff. Did you guys see Wizard of Lies? Yes. And you know, my favorite part was that Hank Azaria, you know, from The Simpsons, the voice of so many Simpsons characters, was the voice of the guy, the the trustee responsible for recovering the funds. And so he was an awesome, he's an awesome actor. He is a good actor. Yeah. You didn't watch it, did you? I Look, I have read, I watched it. Absolutely. I did watch it. Um, what I did is I listened to um, recently some of uh, C- the CNBC American Greed um, where some they sat down with Bernie after the fact while he was in prison. He's one of the few writers that got to go and, and sit with Bernie and became Bernie's friend while he was in the joint. And talking about just like the level of, 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 of oh, I don't want to say psychopath. That's not fair. But just um, maybe. Uh, what, what's, what's the he word? Sociopath. Pathological. Sociopath, path, yeah. pathological. Right. Narcissistic. It, narcissistic, inward focused. Even when he's in prison and he's saying, I'm really sorry what I, I did. But, you know, at our house, it's I'm sorry. There's no I'm no sorry, but, you know, kind of discussions. And that up until the, till the very end, he was more worried about how he was doing in prison uh, than how other people were doing. I'm really sorry for the other people, but. Yep. And I did. he didn't show a whole lot of remorse. He blamed a lot of other people. And I would encourage our listeners out there to go research Bernie Madoff because there are a lot of layers to this and there is some nuance. But at the end of the day, what he did was horrific. Absolutely horrific. As far as the actual movie goes, let's talk about, just because a big part of the movie, they kind of make Ruth Madoff and the two sons, who are victims too, no doubt, um, but they also played a part in it, much more so than the innocent victims. They kind of make them sympathetic. How do we feel about that? Well, I think that the question on that is, what did they know and when did they know it? I don't think we can say that they know and they were part of it. I guess you could say somebody knew something was wrong and turn their head and by turning your head you're a part of it right yeah. but i don't think that there's there's any proven evidence that says that they knew and turned away the sons were the ones who actually went to the police um when madoff said he needed an extra week to get this straightened out before anybody found out about it they went that night so i it's not i, I don't i think time will tell and what we'll, maybe we'll, we'll we'll figure it out at some point but i don't think yeah, part of it is is probably too generic of a term. Part of it, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder though, and you know, it's hard to base an opinion on a movie, even though this is based on a nonfiction book and interviews with Madoff from prison. But in the movie, at one point, the FBI goes to the seventeenth floor, which is the advisory business, which is where all the illegal activity was taking place. Mm-hmm. And the son said they had never been in that room, but the secretary uses her key card to let the FBI into that room. And I was just like, if that's accurate, that makes this impossible to believe that one night, one day, the sons would never, you know, whatever. What is in the 17th floor? I want to go see what's in there. No one's here. I'm going to go, you know, just open the door and take a look around. That part of it, I was just sort of like, I mean, they had to know something unless they were just being naive or dumb or I mean, or lying or a combination of the three, or maybe they were just intoxicated by wealth and didn't want to find out the truth. Or family dynamics. You know, there's, there's a lot stewing in this whole case. And, you know, um, I, I think history 
is filled with examples of family members not calling things out that non-family members would because there's this this sort of family um, aura that goes along with it, you know, and who knows? I mean, in some organizations, the professional assistant or the secretary or whatever title you want to use actually has more authority and more access than even officers of an organization. So, you know, out of the gate, that doesn't totally surprise me. Um, but I think when you consider um, the overall scope of this crime, the depth, the length of it, I think if if there was real, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, if there was real culpability there, I think those people would would be in the exact same place Bernie was. He wasn't a sacrificial lamb that went there to spare his family. I mean, I think his level of narcissist, he would have torched his whole family if it meant he could go free. And so, you know, I mean, I, I can see it both ways. I'm not, I'm not completely convinced that, that they were guilty. I'm not completely convinced that they were innocent. And I'm not going to do it based upon a Hollywood fix fictionalization. Hollywood exactly. never <laughs> bends the truth, Michelle. Hollywood <laughs> never bends the truth. All right. Well, one more one more question I wanted to ask you about The Wizard of Lies and Madoff in general before we move on is in the movie, again, it shows Ruth Madoff at the end driving like an old Corolla, delivering meals on wheels. And she might have just been doing this to do good in the community and felt guilty about what happened. But according to all accounts, she was left with one or two million dollars after, you know, the, the civil suits and everything seized all of the funds and all the assets. Tim since you have a legal degree and you're far more learned than Kim Kardashian at this point, can you tell us how on earth, if they robbed all of those people that she would be able to keep anything? Well, I, I want to start off by saying I did pass the baby bar. Oh, so take that Kardashian. And I'm rather handsome. So, you know, we've got that going too, but uh, well, this is a podcast. Here, we yeah, can't confirm we go. that. Edit, edit. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it, that that's also kind of interesting because, um, you know, she, she was allowed to keep two and a half million dollars. That was that was essentially what of of her estate she was allowed to keep. At one point in time, her estate was uh, reported at 70 million. And between the two of them, it was like one hundred and sixty eight million dollars. And, you know, Madoff was a smart guy. He thought, well, if I hide assets in her name, you know, we'll skate from this if I ever get busted, I, you know, this is what he was thinking, right? Th they can't touch these because they're in her name. But of course he greatly underestimated the, the reach of, of the feds, which they can pretty much reach anywhere they want. So, you know, she was allowed to keep two and a half million dollars. I don't find that completely unusual. Um, you know, I don't believe it's the goal of the government in any situation to ever turn anybody into a ward of the state. I mean, that doesn't really serve anybody, but one of the things that they didn't really disclose in the movie, which I think is a very vital piece of information, is that when there were the criminal settlements and all of the things that took place, she really gave everything back. I mean, they didn't just seize everything. She gave a fair amount of it back, but she reached an agreement with them. And and the agreement was, you give me two and a half million dollars, I'm not criminally, li criminally liable for any of this stuff. And I'm going to also be liable to civil suits for the remaining money that I got, at which time the trustee turned around and sued her immediately. And so she was given two and a half million dollars. It was, it, I think it would be akin to like sticking in, in an annuity. She's living off of the income off of two and a half million dollars, which, you know, if you figure up standard 4%, you know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year. And when she dies, all of the principal uh, residue goes to the settlement trust fund. So she's really just kind of getting to live off of the income of that money. I think that is to, to you know, to prevent the, the tragedy that if she, in fact, didn't really know that she's basically put to poverty. You know, I do know she lives in a, she lives in a one bedroom apartment. You know, this is a woman who went from immense wealth, immense public standing, yachts, fancy houses, houses all over the world to a one bedroom apartment, a Corolla and delivering meals on wheels. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying I sympathize with her. I understand her plight, but I think what happened there is appropriate. And I think that, um, y you know, that money. Oh, and let me add also, she has to have approval for any expense over a hundred dollars. She has to report her expenses to the trustee monthly. 
So, so she's almost living a sort of financial incarceration, so to speak. I know a lot of people would love to have a hundred thousand dollars of income a year. I get it. But, but this is how it played out. And that wasn't disclosed in the movie. Who's doing your research for the podcast and why did this not all come out in the podcast meeting? I've got to keep something up my sleeve. Okay. Fair enough. All right. We'll move on. We'll move on. So Ponzi schemes happen all the time. They've happened throughout history, like we mentioned, starting with Charles Ponzi. And he actually wasn't the first. That's just who they named the scheme after. So let's talk about some prominent ones throughout history. Lou Pearlman. Does that ring a bell, Michelle? Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Got that. I want it that way. <laughs> He's the man behind the platinum-selling boy bands in Sync and Backstreet Boys. Lou Pearlman's legacy also includes a massive Ponzi scheme. In addition to being sued by the very boy bands he created for stealing their money, he also swindled. It's a term we're using a lot on this podcast, swindled. It's a good word. Investors and banks out of more than $300 million on the basis of a companies that only existed on paper. In 2008, he was convicted of conspiracy and money laundering charges and sentenced to 25 years in federal prison. He died at the age of 62 in 2016. Wow. Don't go to federal prison if you want to live a long time, right? Yes. That's their slogan to keep people out of jail. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's on billboards, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Criminals check in, but <laughs> they on, don't, don't check, check out. out. <laughs> on the way to Leavenworth, <laughs> this is the billboard. <laughs> oh, gosh. Timmy, good God. Anyway, all right, let's talk about another one. Reed Slatkin. That sounds kind of, that name in of itself kind, sounds kind of Ponzi esque. I wouldn't have given him Slatkin. a check. Slatkin. Slatkin. Mm -mm. uh, 593 million was his Ponzi scheme. He is known as the co founder of Earthlink, the internet service provider that people in the 90s will remember. Um, prosecutors say that Reed Slatkin's massive Ponzi scheme began before Earthlink existed. In 2003, the former Santa Barbara investment manager pled guilty to defrauding his investors of more than $500 million across 15 years, starting in 1986. Here's a question I have about that, though. So he started off cheating people, but then he started a successful company. Wouldn't you just figure out a way to kind of, you know, quietly, like, right those wrongs and just go legitimate? Do you think somebody that cheats and gets away with it just kind of looks around and says, I'm not a cheater anymore? Like there was something in his heart that said, I'm going to, I'm going to need to do this because I deserve this or this is the only way forward. I don't think people just have righteous changes hearts on a regular basis just because they started making money legitimately. Right. I mean, that's like fraud 101. You yeah. know, I, 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 I agree. And, and I would also have to say, you know, yeah, he had this Ponzi scheme side hustle, but you know, Earthlink, eh, yeah, <laughs> you know, what was that? I mean, I remember that. I remember I was like, why, why am I paying for this? So, you know, there, there might be an element there like too. Earthlink prodigy, all the nineties internet. Providers. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like here, you know, waiting, 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 waiting. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I, I think the interesting thing out of all these examples we're going to talk about today is that, you know, you can commit fraud just as easily as a side hustle as you can as your main line of work. And, you know, and anyone can do it. Look at these guys. You know, they've got their own money. They've got their own thing going. And it speaks to the narcissistic personality. I need more. And Madoff talked about this. They do make some of their clients a lot of money, which maybe justifies it in their head that they're actually doing good. Because some clients do make money off this because they guarantee these ridiculous returns and some of the early investors or others actually get paid out. Luckily, I have no idea what a fraudster thinks in their head and how they justify things. That hasn't been something I've walked through. The thing I look at when I see this is that was, he did it for 15 years. Guys. Wow. This isn't like I started a fund, I raised a bunch of money, screwed a couple people and got caught in nine months. Um. 15 years. Like, deliberate. Deliberate. I don't know how long made of stuff went on for. Uh, his was 16. It was a long time. It was, it, yeah. it was legitimate for a while too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, said no one ever, hey, I want to go into a career as a Ponzi scheme owner, you know, and, <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and so, day, career day. You know, it's like, day. yeah, it's like, hey, hey, mom, I'm going to go to college so that I can learn how to run Ponzi schemes. <laughs> Not going to happen. So, you know, it's interesting to see these guys. They're layering legitimate business interests, and it's almost like the legitimate business interest is a front for where they're really at. Very well said. And finally, very recently, like we've been saying, these happen all the time. Zach Horwitz, a bit actor, better known by better known by his stage name, Zach Avery, allegedly swindled investors out of investments around a billion dollars to pay for his lavish lifestyle. He claimed important Hollywood relationship relationships and promising investors that his company would acquire and license film rights through agreements with companies like Netflix and HBO. He fabricated documents with logos, made promissory notes guaranteeing returns, allegedly funded old investors with new investors' money, like we've been saying. He is currently facing 20 years in prison. I would never trust a bit actor with millions of dollars, ever. I think he's got an inadequacy complex. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a bit actor, you know, I got little bits and pieces of here and there. Let me go big. I don't Let me start a Ponzi scheme. I don't think bit actors know they're bit actors, guys. Like, I don't think that they wake. <laughs> <laughs> let me think about my psyche. Let me think about get back to my psyche. Fifteen years ago, you're right. I thought it was a very big deal. You right. You were not a bit actor, Underwood. I promise. I, I I will I will pull up all of your clips for the audience here at some point. But this is this this is a Ponzi scheme. Clearly, I just can't imagine how much I'd love to know more about this. Like as, as this trial rolls out, what due diligence did his investors do? Like at some point it's like, do you pick up the phone and call somebody at Netflix and ask him if Horowitz is getting a deal or not? Like what kinds of things did the investors before they gave money to a, a seemingly bit actor, what that, what did they do for due diligence before they started writing the checks? He may have been great. These might have been awesome fakes, and they called and did the things, and he was just that good. Um, but I'm always, I, I like to see this one play out so that we can kind of see hey, what tricks he used to be able to fool people into to giving him giving him money um, for film rights and things that are pretty contractually like. They're well known. They're well defined. You right. know, th there's groups that do nothing but that. And yeah, I, you know, I always wonder if, if in all of these situations, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of group think that goes on, you know, Absolutely. word of mouth spreads, you know, we have, we have, we have our personal biases, you know, the old biases of like to make a lot of money without working too hard, or I've, you know, I'm overconfident, you know, confirmation biases, lots of things make us make irrational decisions. And but I think, especially in a lot of these cases, people go to trusted family members, friends, professional advisors, and it just takes one person to be the conduit in to what ultimately becomes that house of cards. Imagine if you had one really great referral source, how easy it would be for these guys to pull this off. And, and you have to imagine that all of these people are very good at understanding personalities and and manipulating people. And and so they convince one good referral source, it's golden. And you get groupthink. You get a bunch of lemmings running down the road. Give me, give me your money. Give me your money. Give me your money. So maybe he's not as bad an actor as we thought he was. Maybe Whoa. not. Maybe not, you know. Do they give Grammy? You're not Grammy. That's for music. Do they Oscars. give Oscars for, for, for Ponzi for, schemes? For Ponzi schemes? Because there's, you know. But, you know, he's going to be doing theater in the round um, <laughs> somewhere. Okay. Well done, Tim. On that note, let's... Um... <laughs> Sorry. Theater in the round in the fed pen. <laughs> Can you f***ing imagine? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I'm sorry, PJ. I come I'm to sorry. Barry Madoff. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm just picturing it. I'll get, I'm, whew. Okay, go ahead. All right. And, and scene. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> okay, since Michelle was talking about due diligence, let's talk about ways we can protect people. You, the listeners, can protect yourselves 
from falling victim to one of these. Okay, so we're gonna go through some tools, if you will, and some things to consider and some ways you can kind of see if it might be BS, your the investment and or the person selling it. So I think number one, and you guys stop me if you're if I'm wrong, use common sense. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I think that's true. I mean, but I, I think that's true. And it, it, you know, where that really applies is, you know, hey, this investment has returned 18% a year over the last 18 years. Of course, that sounds too good to be true if you understand anything about the market. But what if it's this investment returns 9% this year, 15% this year, 3%, you know, I mean, you know, these things can take all sorts of different forms. And I think I, I think just to expand on what you said, I would say you need to be skeptical about your investments. Approach them with an air of skepticism and let your professional prove prove the point, right? Absolutely. And another huge thing, this might be the biggest red flag. There are no guarantees, right, in investing. In fact, it's illegal to make guarantees. You cannot guarantee results. So watch out for phrases like risk free. Everyone is doing it. You know, that's why, you know, they say past performance is not indicative of future results, right at the end of every, right. And then if you get a prospectus for a new fund, and what that's going to be looking like, there should be flags and marks all over it that says these are not guarantees, right. And so that's for stocks and bonds. And if you're doing other investments, um, personal investments, like if you're investing, in a apartment complex with some other partners in um, a town nearby and the uh, guy who's selling you the investment into the um, apartment says we're going to return 30 percent a year on this you say give me all the numbers let them give me give that to my financial advisor let me give that to the cpa and stress test it look and see because there's a lot of due diligence that can be done even on these different kinds of investments that a small business owners make every day, um, that really, really should be done for these limited partnerships, joint ventures, and other investments that people make. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, there's a truth in the fraud world, and that is if somebody really wants to defraud you, and they're really going to be active about it, at some point in that time frame, they can pull it off. Because you know, it may be early in the process, your due diligence isn't going to catch it. But 99% of the time, due diligence is the speed bump you need. So due diligence, like that's, that's a lawyer term. It's an accounting term because we do it when we help clients buy things, buy businesses and stuff like that. So due diligence is asking a little bit more for, I guess, you know, we were talking about Zach a minute ago, you know, copies of those um, film rights contracts. Um, the promissory notes. The promissory notes. Talking to other people, not just um, not just Zach. You know, talking to when I was, you know, the apartment owner, um, not just the guy who's putting together the deal. Maybe drive by, and make sure a building's actually there. Um, look at the deeds. Mm -hmm. Look at the stuff. Just that extra level of work where you're not just relying on a prospectus or statements from your brother-in-law um, at Thanksgiving. That's right. In the banking industry, we call that kicking the tires. Kicking the tires. Kick the tires. I think it's also really important to choose, but choose wisely. I was trying to do the night from Indiana Jones. Do you guys remember that? No, no. Okay. Bad but, reference. It, okay. <laughs> what I mean by that is interview more than just one financial advisor. I don't care if it's your sister's financial advisor and she loves them. Interview more than one and choose as you would a doctor or an attorney. You're going to have a relationship with this person. So there has to be trust. You have to feel like, you know, you can work with them, you can be around with them, you can have honest conversations, and you can trust them. Now, clearly, people trusted Madoff and other people, but I think a lot of them, too, just went with him blindly based upon referrals without doing any due diligence or without doing any research. They just, okay, yeah, he likes him, she likes him, so I'll go with him. Interview more than one. Interview three or four. Take as much time as it needs until you find the right person. Yeah, check, you know, check the industry databases, make sure, you know, that they haven't had any sort of infractions filed against them or paid fines. I mean, you know, all that stuff is publicly available information. And your local state is more than happy to give you all of that data about any one of us. Use Earthlink to dial up and get on brokercheck.com. 
<laughs> well, let's see. That would be about year 18 into the Madoff thing, right? But they do have brokercheck.com powered by FINRA, you know, where you can do those things. Because I think, I think that's a really important part is to interview and talk to make sure that you have a relationship with this person, that they're not talking at you, over you, using words um, to make themselves sound more inflated and more important, and you don't feel comfortable with what they're representing and how they're actually helping you craft your, your financial investments. Yeah, I think they ought to be able to put it into plain English and, and let you know exactly where you're at so that you fully understand what you're on board for. I just had a potential client email me and asked really specific questions, a lot of them. One of very uh, like detailed answers, and I was happy to do that um, because that's smart. On his end, it's smart on everyone's end. That's what I would do if I was in their position. So never be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to question what they're saying or, like they just said, break it down into plain English. The other thing is demand detailed reports. Now, obviously, Madoff and the bid actor were providing some form of financial statements. But if they're just giving you one page, that's not enough. There's no such thing as a one page, you know, <laughs> investment report. It does not exist. If you get one, you should ask for more. Yeah, <laughs> you should exactly. ask for more detail. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I, I'll use again SSC Wealth as the example. Um, the reports aren't generated at our offices. They don't come from the Lawrence office or the Topeka office. They come direct, directly to you from our custodian, Fidelity. When you get your information, you're logged into fidelity.com. So it, I think that um, knowing where the reports come from, how they're being generated, and um, being able to rely upon the investment return information that's on those reports, mm -hmm. uh, and then asking questions if it doesn't make sense. Yeah, word to you on that. You know, I mean, we're taught from an early age to balance our checking accounts from the bank statement. Well, your investment statement's no different. You should look at it every month. It should make sense, and, and A plus B, should equal C if that's what the math is, but you have to pay attention to those things. You were taught to balance your checkbook from a very young age. I can see that. With I was. With an abacus back in the 20s. Yes, abacus. Uh, actually, we used uh, we used stones to start with. <laughs> They're easier to handle. I mean, it's just, you know, when you're, when you're one, I mean, your hands aren't fully, you know, so you want something bigger to grasp. I actually pictured him balancing it on his head as he walked across a tightrope. I didn't think he was actually doing any math. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One last thing, one last bit of advice as far as um, something you can do, a tool to protect yourself. We touched on this earlier, but please be careful even in safe places. Churches, country clubs, community organizations are, I mean, prime hunting grounds for people that could pitch Ponzi schemes. Again, rely on research over referrals from friends and relatives and research your referrals. I, you know, I think you could add one to this though, and that is, you know, if you uncover evidence of wrongdoing, you need to report it. Absolutely. Because a lot of times people find out they've been swindled and they're embarrassed. And, you know, and if it's not for a lot of money, they might not do anything about it. And you absolutely have to report this because you might find out that you're just the tip of the iceberg. Quick recap. Use common sense, ask questions, don't just blindly trust referrals. There are tools out there like BrokerCheck, which can tell you instantly whether a person or, for, or firm is registered as required by law to sell securities. There's the SEC's Edgar database for free corporate information, the fee-based pacer.gov to search federal lawsuits and bankruptcies. Or you can also just go to your local courthouse and see if there's been any scams or, you know, any sort of wrongdoing by the person that claims to be, you know, a financial advisor. Google it. Google it. <laughs> Uncle Google. I encourage everyone to Google Tim Metz. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, that'd be a short Google. That's it for today's episode of the Trust Us, We're Professionals podcast brought to you by all of us at SSC CPAs and Advisors. If you ever have any financial questions, concern about your financial advisor or an investment, you can always reach out to us through our website, www.ssccpas.com. Once again, that's www.ssccpas.com. You can also email the show big time. Got an email now podcast at sscpas.com. Timmy, Shelley, thank you very much. We'll see you guys next time.
This podcast was recorded and is being made available by SSC Solutions Inc. Together with its affiliates and its employees, SSC, solely for informational purposes. SSC is not providing or undertaking to provide any financial, economic, legal, accounting, tax, or any other advice in or by virtue of this podcast. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions provided in this podcast are general in nature, and such information, statements, comments, views, and opinions in the receipt of this podcast by any listener are not intended to be and should not be construed as a provision of investment advice by SSC, that listener, or generally, and do not result in any listener being considered a client or customer of SSC. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions expressed in this podcast do not constitute and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make any investment course of action. The information, statements, comments, views, and opinions expressed or provided in this podcast, including by speakers who are not officers, employees, or agents of SSC, are not necessarily those of SSC and may not be current. SSC does not make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of any of the information, statements, comments, views, or opinions contained in this podcast. Any liability thereof, including in respect of direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage of any kind whatsoever, is expressly disclaimed. SSC does not undertake any obligation whatsoever to provide any form of update, amendment, change, or correction to any of this information, statements, comments, views, or opinions set forth in this podcast. No part of this podcast may, without SSC Solutions Inc.'s prior written consent, be reproduced, redistributed, published, copied, or duplicated in any form by any means.